on red teaming, uh, what to do, what not to do, things like that. Um, so if you just kind of wondered in here, um, actually, how many people in here are actually pen testers or do penetration testing? Red teaming, things like red that. Team stuff. Cool. All right. And what about the blue team side? Cool. All right, so I think that you're going to get some benefits from this talk, uh, either, well, no matter what side you're on, um, on identifying things, and then also the red team having that extra mile. So um, I can see my face. Cool. That's how it's supposed to work, you know. <laughs> scoping. <laughs> so when you're looking at uh, scoping, um, a few things you want to talk, look at when you are setting this up for like red team, blue team. So it, what's this? Is it scenario based? You know, is this a bank? Do you have a certain server that you want people to try and get to to get PII, or is it, you know what what kind of company is it? What do they have? What's the ultimate end goal, the ultimate treasure chest that you don't ever want to have compromised? And so, you know, you mentioned a few different things. This could incorporate, you know, executive suites, offices, server room, or whatever. Typically, you know, the, the gold mine is the server room. You want to get to the server room once you're in there. you got access to the core switch and everything else. So you're good to go. Um, but you might want to push that a little bit further, uh, target individuals, fishing, whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, images we chose may or may not have been chosen while we were drinking bourbon. Uh, <laughs> so it should be interesting. Uh, reconnaissance, so we're all, hopefully all familiar with, with open source intelligence. Obviously, that's, that's where you look at the target and you see Okay, what departments do they have? What are some names of people in the, par the departments? Things such as LinkedIn, Google, uh, so many resources out there where you can go and sort of get an idea of maybe who you want to go after, or maybe to just fill your backstory. That way, you can have something intelligent to say when you encounter someone. This could also be uh, even the job posting. You know, what kind of environment? What kind of tools? Uh, is it a Cisco environment? What is it? Um, it's important to note that stuff because it does help you flesh out your backstory. So if you get backed into a corner and someone's asking you questions, you're like, uh, Aruba. I don't know. <laughs> we don't use Aruba here. So you're automatically caught and you're compromised, right? So you want to make sure that you adjust uh, whatever fictitious story you come up with accordingly. Uh, and doing this also, your employee culture. Um, for example, right now, uh, I got long hair and a beard. That may not be the best. Uh, appearance to go to some places because they may have a we, we deal with some federal clients that they have restrictions on that so you want to kind of pay attention to how the employees dress uh, you can observe that from a parking lot or, or whatever during lunch break seeing people come in and out uh, a Starbucks next to the company easy to also look at their badge how the badge layout is get a good idea of that um, you know if you want to clone the badge or steal it or whatever um, you know, those are opportune times to do that. So always pay attention to the, uh, the culture and the dress code. And that goes right along with the prepared guys. Is, uh, is everyone wearing a suit and tie? And do they have maintenance? Or is there construction going on? Maybe they have construction and they have guys from AT&T or something walking around with hard hats and clipboards. Uh, so just those are all things to pay attention to, you know, what's going on. What can I jump in and become a part of? So those are all things to just pay attention to before you go in. You know, a good thing to do also, if you uh, look at the visitor log at a lot of these uh, companies, as soon as you walk in, you can see a list of the vendors too. So you know, okay, well, just drop a name, Kodak or whatever. They've got these vendors here. Now I have a list of, of some guys so that I can go home and start creating or ordering uniforms or whatever. Yeah. So uh, pay attention. I mean, those are little things that sometimes we don't even consider because we go in there and uh, we don't think, oh, well, they got the sign-in log right here. Now I can drop a bunch of names, uh, departments, and contractors, and vendors, etc. Yeah. Be bold and confident also. Uh, this is very important, uh, especially for social engineering. <clears throat> if you, uh, I know a lot of people, there's some guys on our team too that are great social engineers little technical knowledge and then there's some guys with extreme technical knowledge and then they 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 get really nervous when they talk to people 
So it's important that before you do any kind of um, social engineering work, especially on site where you're face to face with somebody, it's a little bit more uh, intimidating, that you have that confidence that you display that uh, ability to roll with the punches or uh, even improv. No. You can, can do, do it. it. <laughs> well, that was weird, don't it? We should not do that at the same time because that's good. <laughs> you should do that too. Yeah. So uh, let's get into a quick st uh, war story. Um, there was a client that me and another uh, another guy were going to, and it was in a small suite. They were a new client. We weren't really sure what happens after hours. You know, what time do people leave? We figured around five, four thirty, five o'clock. But it was hard to tell with the single point of entry, like who else stay, you know, who stays and works late. So we found our way up the stairwell and. We heard voices on the other side of the door. We weren't sure if it was cleaning crew or if it were employees. So basically after um, that, a, a pretty poor system luckily for us to get in. It was just the four button pin entry. So on our 13th try, we guessed it. We opened it up and it was the cleaning crew and it, they just so happened to be going through another door as we came in so they didn't even see us. So that kind of goes along with what Tim was talking about, be bold. We could have been, uh, you know, scared to be caught or whatever and never taken that chance and heard voices and turned around. Uh, you know, long story short, we walked around the place. There were supposed to be security guards watching the cameras. Uh, we found all the information we needed to find, and then we always wanted to give the client the chance to catch us, give them the benefit of the doubt. What can we do so that we can be caught? So we stood in front of the glass doors, and there was a like a half-inch physical gap between the doors and a motion sensor on the other side. So I had a clothes hanger and some napkins, and I tied it and stuck it through the door, and I was like, well, let's see if the security guard's paying attention. Literally standing there doing this, <laughs> and then the, the door actually didn't open. I think the degree was too much to pick up the thing, so put it down, laid it there, and then we stand in front of the door, we face the camera, and we start doing jumping jacks. <laughs> so, and, and the security guard never came, so we did that for about five or six minutes, and we got tired. So, uh, so again, that's, you know, where is security? So that's kind of, just pay attention, when does everybody leave? On top of, you got to take some risks. Uh, had someone approach us, we had what we thought was a good backstory, but <laughs> Uh, unfortunately for the company, we didn't get a chance to have that confrontation because uh, I guess everyone, including security, had checked out for the day. So, You know, Jason mentioned earlier about uh, getting caught on, on purpose. Uh, he, he brought up a great point. Once you get in there and you've gotten, you've pretty much looted the place, right? And you're ready to leave. Well, that's when you also got to consider, is incident handling and response a part of this? Are we testing to see if they follow through with this stuff? So that's also one of the motivating uh, factors when considering about, you know, hey, I, I need to try to get caught here just to see if they escalate properly. Uh, so always keep that in the back of your mind. So uh, a few things we want to do, just a, a quick little exercise to kind of break the monotony. Um, there's a few things you can do when you are approached and someone says, what are you doing? It's a typical sales tactic. The, the rule goes, whoever's asking the question is the one controlling the conversation. So, um, you know, if you go on the pla uh, place and someone asks you a question, uh, just immediately answer that with another question. And it takes some practice if you're not used to doing that. It's a little awkward. Um, so we have some tips. So, for example, if I go into a place to say Tim's a security guard and he asks me, like, hey. Say so he doesn't have a badge or something. I'm like, hey, where's your badge? Let me say, uh, I'm going to be looking around at him, you know, seeing what he's doing. Especially can, if he's filling it around, too. Because, I mean, if you're a security yeah, guard and it's an armed security guard, then you're probably a little more on high alert. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be careful, too. So, you, you know, something you're going to be like, uh, oh, I've, uh, you know, crap, where's my car keys thing? Uh, well, it's uh, around here. Uh, hey, in a little bit, we're going to go to lunch. We heard there's this awesome barbecue place around. Do you know anything about that? Just to kind of, I mean, that sounds silly, but just a quick, hey, where where do you suggest to go to lunch? And so it's a quick way to put the question back on them, and hopefully they're cool enough to answer it, then you can kind of get some camaraderie going on, build that trust, and eventually, you know, I uh, left it in my car, I'll be right back, I'll go get it, which is much easier than uh, 
oh, don't have one. Okay, well, you're coming with you me, me, and then you're busted, you know. Uh, so at least you have a, a way to get out um, and try again later. Have you, uh, anybody in here watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Well, recently they uh, they broke into the FBI, and the guy, you know, the captain's up there, and he's talking to the security guard, distracting him, but they found out prior to that the security guard loves sex in the city. So he goes up there, he starts talking about sex in the city, and they get in this conversation about it forever <laughs> while the other guy's sneaking in. So if you have a team, if you're doing like a tiger team kind of approach or a red team approach, and you've got multiple consultants or pen testers on site, then uh, being able to carry a, on a conversation like that and just even, you know, like Jason mentioned, looking at the stuff on their desk, they got an action figure on there, or Captain America or whatever. Oh, yeah, is Captain America really your favorite Avenger? You know, and then get them going and start talking about that stuff. And they're completely invested in that conversation. Yep. And it's a little bit easier to fly by. Yeah, redirection. So, uh, the stranger. This is something that, a bit of improv, if, if you don't have time to take, like, acting improv classes or anything like that. A free way to do it, go to the mall, sit down next to a total stranger, have a conversation about your entire life. But your entire life is something that you are making up on the fly. You you never tell them the truth. And do it in a way where it's believable. And if you're terrible at it, they're gonna like you're, you're gonna know that you're a bad liar. Keep trying that. Um, you can also try with the redirection whenever someone asks just a simple conversation, whenever someone asks you a question, answer them with a question. Again, that kind of takes practice to do that where you're comfortable and where it seems natural as opposed to, you know, stuttering a little bit and making it look unnatural where I'm trying to trying to get you off track. So uh, practice that. It's, it's a good way for improv. So got a volunteer. Volunteer. Eager. It doesn't hurt. There you go. New Horizons. Right. You can stay there. So let's try this. Like, I'm just going to talk to you and you're going to feed me a bunch of BS the entire time. So. I'm going to feed you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, He's having a terrible time. He just told us it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Fail. So uh, what do you do Knew for it. a living? Um, I'm actually an instructor. Instructor? Oh, what do you teach? Uh, I teach uh, CISSP classes. I teach uh, everything from Air Plus, Security Plus, Network, CISSP, uh, CEH, and a few others. Okay. So are you teaching for EC Council, or are you teaching, what are you doing? No, they're... Uh, Basically, cert uh, certification preparation courses and uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, was any of that true? You work for New Horizons, so I feel, assume that's the truth. <laughs> I kind of felt like you were telling me the truth the entire time. Some of my teeth smell, I don't. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, but you know, even building on something that you're more comfortable with, right? Because if you're detecting a lie, you can tell when somebody's usually nervous and jittery. Mm -hmm. If you've got uh, kind of an established background in, in something already, and you can plug that in there somehow, use it. Because mm -hmm. you're going to be a little bit na more naturally comfortable talking about something that you're used to, right? Mm -hmm. So the exercise number three, going in cold. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of an exercise we were working on when we were trying to come to, we were trying to make a class, like a workshop for, for DEF CON. And uh, I think uh, this, this is a good exercise maybe to do um, with some of your coworkers and stuff. But you say, hey, one person's a client. They know three things. They know uh, the name of the company. They have the name of the company. They have a point of contact's name, and they know where the server room is. So the other person, the pen tester, you're dropped in. You don't know anything other than the name of the company and where it's at. So you're dropped in the parking lot. Last minute, you're in. You approach. You walk inside. Bam. Your goal is to find out those three things without giving yourself away. Yep. And and by directing the conversation. How did you find that out without walking in and saying, hey, what do you guys do? And what's the name of your network manager? <laughs> oh, your server room. Where's that? Okay. So doing that kind of exercise can help you with improv, but also just thinking on the fly and, and tying all three of these exercises together. Because um, improv is so important, and I encourage a lot of people that get into social engineering, and whether it's over the phone or whether it's an email or, or on site, to take an improv class, especially if you're engaging in real-time conversation. It's easier with an email because you can pre-construct it and you can edit it as much as you want before you send it out, unless it's China and some poorly worded phishing email. But you, if you do that, 
uh, that's a little, you know, it's not, not as hard. But when you're talking to somebody on the phone or you're face to face with somebody, you start sweating and, and it's hard to get that adrenaline back down. You have all those nonverbal cues that you oftentimes don't even know that you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, um, you want to try that? Somebody, you try that. Um, we could. Anybody else want to volunteer? We haven't tried this in a talk yet, but, you know, why not? There you go. All right, go for it, Tim. All right, so uh, we... I'll, I'll let you crash and burn if it doesn't go well. All right, there we go. What's your first name? Huh? What's your first name? My, my first name? Okay, are we doing this now? Yeah, you're real. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> Tim. Okay, so You blew say... it, Tim. We're done. <laughs> got it. Okay, so let's say this. You're dropped in. You're... You've got to find out what they do, uh, the point of contact's name, and where the server room is. Client, point of contact, server room. Yep. Okay, so you walk in, security guard looks at you, hey, uh, can I help you? Um, yeah. This is, I'm here, and my, my boyfriend is, is, works here, and I know that you can see from Tim, I know that you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, that's incredible. We'll talk about it. All right. Well, um, I feel a little threatened, so uh, <laughs> so we're gonna get you out of this building as soon as possible. <laughs> and that that's actually that he deserves a round of applause. Yeah, that, for that. that good. So, and that's that's actually great because uh, one of a popular tactic with social engineering is. You want to make someone feel as uncomfortable as possible, <laughs> and that's the true thing. If, if you're if you're caught against a wall and someone starts asking you questions, then right away you it, make them feel uncomfortable with something that you might uh, might make them feel uncomfortable, or automatically become the biggest jerk in the room. Like I've got this meeting and I'm I bust my butt to get here, and I'm not going to let someone like you make me late. Uh, and just go on and on and on and uh, get your supervisor in here right now. They're going to know who I am and you're going to be in deep, you know, whatever. So uh, just just kind of going over the top. People hate confrontation. People love to help. We're all, you know, most people are kind-hearted by nature and want to help. So whenever you bring confrontation, they want to avoid that. And most people just say, you know what, man, I've got my own problems. I don't feel like hearing you. Right now, just go on. I don't even care. Yeah, I don't so, get paid enough for this yeah. or, or whatever. But, you know, to tie into that, uh, we actually had, uh, doing doing something at an airport here, um, we had two consultants, a female and a male. And uh, they, they were, it, the female was pregnant. So they played on that. They acted like they were a couple and they were arguing, blah, blah, blah. And they ended up getting into some HR room with a bunch of files arguing in there. Somebody walked in and then they just like, and they just closed the door yeah. and left them alone. Yeah. So works. That kind of stuff works. Uh, you know, the counter to that though is some security guards, especially, they're eager for confrontation. They've been waiting their whole life for it. Mm. And I'm not, you know, I'm not bashing that at all because that's good when you're, when you're that aware. Um, there's good, good and bad. So, um, always kind of weigh the situation and, and try to determine what that person's like. You can usually get a bite of somebody, right? If yeah, they're angry quick. or they're very defensive off the fly, well, maybe you don't want to start throwing the, the uh, abrasive tone, right? Yeah. Um, and sometimes you've got to be a little bit nicer. And we're not, we don't want to you know, pitch any specific books because there's some great books out there, but this is one that uh, yeah, I won't say the a name again because we're not trying to endorse products or anything, but this is one that I've been uh, really kind of revisiting. It's got some good refreshers on body language, nonverbal cues, how to speed read. Uh, it's written by an ex-FBI agent, and it's a guide to speed reading people, um, you know, things like eye blocking, nervous habits, uh, ways just to really pick up to see if somebody's hiding something from you or hates you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. What everybody's. Uh, yeah, there's there's a few different ones out there, but this one uh, it's a really good. If you've had classes before on on body language and, and reading people, this is a really good refresher for that. Otherwise, if you're brand new to it, uh, 
some good ideas, but maybe things that you want to sort of study a little bit more in depth. So and This is good for red team and blue team, right? Yeah, we got, we got a question right here, Tim. Um, can you address how, how would you respond to the eager for confrontation sort of security guard in that situation? Well, a lot of prep work, I think. Especially, I mean, I usually like to fake a badge or forge a badge and have that on me uh, at all times. And we're going to get into what we consider our backup plan, too, for just those people. Um, without getting into it too prematurely in the talk, I, I will say that, you know, it, you do handle it a different way. You're, you got to be a little bit more nicer. You can't let them know that you're defeated either. So being too nice or too lowering it too low, now I don't have confidence anymore, and I feel like I'm kind of getting caught and I'm slowing down my engagement. Yeah, so. people that are good at their jobs, they pick up on that feeling of defeat automatically, and some people just it gives them even more of a feeling of power to like drag you out into the parking lot so one of my other uh one of my other pen test jobs too I, that, I, that i did prior to solutionary i was i was on site with a guy and there's a security guard there's side doors there's back doors you know but he goes in the front door and there's a security guard there so you also need to choose how you're entering the building if it if it's just one area and there's a security guard there and a man trap and all that stuff then you know you're restricted to that area but oftentimes like an emergency exit uh, or the side doors, especially around lunch, you see people coming in and out. Those are opportune times to tailgate from the side, especially if you've got just a face badge or a flipped uh, head badge or something like that hanging across your neck. Most people don't pay attention to the sound or the color of the, of the proximity reader, reader uh, if you're following behind them. You just go through the motion. Yeah, we've, we've addressed some of the backing techniques and things like that in some of our other talks that we, we don't want to keep repeating everything, but if, if you're interested in some of those, how to uh, play on the helpful nature of others, it sounds terrible saying that, yeah. uh, just come talk to us afterwards and we can give you some tips and pointers. Exploit nice people. Yeah. I, I was just going to add on, we, uh, my, my company, and we carry around like newspapers that says, you know, we've approved the year. Right. You get caught, you're kind of scared. You want to reach for your paper, but like, don't reach for your pockets right. because yeah. if you do have the security guard that's like waiting for his opportunity, like, you know, don't be quick to like reach for things. Oh, like, I got this. Wow. Yeah. 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 This escalated quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I keep my letter right here <laughs> in my Velcro pockets. Yeah. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> So, uh, the anvil, that's an awesome bag to carry on. Uh, the setup, again, <laughs> Google results, fake pictures. Uh, so, in, in the abstract of the talk we mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, forging fake IDs, uh, which we have to be very careful on what we talk about with that. We, we've uh, kind of been asked not to get too in-depth with, with that, but... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, Tim, do you want to talk about that so yeah. I'm not get in trouble? Yeah, no, I mean, okay, so depending on the kind of ID that the company uses, you know, you, there's there's kind of that line, right? So always make sure when you're doing your kickoff call, you know, even prior to that, you're writing up your statement of work. You're talking to the client saying, hey, here's kind of our method, here's our methodology, here's what we usually do. Uh, we're going to try to, to to steal the badge. If it's RFID, we're going to try to clone it. Or we're, you know, if we don't have the time, we're just going to try to make in Photoshop, print it off, put it on a on a blank badge. Or take one. Or take one. So um, just, you know, just always make sure, I think, the most important takeaway to that is to discuss it with the client prior just to make sure you're in the good. Because if, uh, if they've got some kind of like, uh, what, the military IDs and stuff like that, and you're forging that, yeah. you're kind of getting some shady waters there. Yeah, and you also don't want to, like, forge badges and impersonate officers and things. That is a felony. So, um, Google results. So if you walk in and you say, hey, I'm so I, I'm Brent with, with Microsoft. I'm Microsoft rep. I'm here to talk to uh, James in the IT department, head of IT. Uh, some people will say, okay, well, they'll actually take the time to Google. Or if you're trying to set up a meeting, hey, do you have some time on Tuesday? This is who I am. Here's my number. Uh, there are a few websites out there where you can actually pay and have them generate fake Google results. So when you search Brent White uh, Microsoft, 
it will come up and like Microsoft sales rep, uh, things like that. So you so now you have that digital footprint, and there are also uh, again we don't want to mention specific apps, but there are also apps out there that will spoof your number. So if you're doing social engineering call or something like that, you can call and it'll actually have say if you know like the internal uh, like the internal extension for the IT department. So you make it look like it's coming from you know 1232 or whatever, and someone answers it. Like, oh, it's IT department calling, but you're nowhere in the building. And then you can say, hey, this is so and so with IT. You need to go to this link and install this patch really quick. Uh, so those are just some helpful helpful tools to help kind of build your credibility with your backstories. Yeah, so. like forwarding numbers to like Google Voice and stuff like that. Uh, having the area codes important. I, uh, when I first started, we were talking about mistakes, or Jason was talking about mistakes. When I first started, I had actually, I forgot to block my, my number, and I called, and it was from an area code completely <laughs> on the other side of, of uh, the United States, and they're like, wait a minute. And they caught me just off of that. So uh, if you're doing any kind of phishing from, from a phone number, uh, and you know, if you're not blocking it or something, um, you know, it's always good to have uh, forwarded numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the letter of authorization, and you were talking earlier. So, what we uh, usually have as our backup plan is a fake letter of authorization. Yep. So, what is this? Um, you know, and I got an example on this next slide, but uh, basically, you're going to take your letter of authorization. You don't want it to be exactly word for word but you want to just kind of strip out some of the verbiage make it as vague as possible so I'm allowed to do this this and this and then you also want to uh, have a fake number uh, like I usually use Brent Brent usually uses me uh, point of contact Brent's from ABC Corporation he's from the office of the CISO and here's his phone number so you know if there's a problem call this guy so what happens is you get this guy that's really confrontational and you're like well crap I'm gonna end up having to pull my letter out well, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to pull out my fake one first. And here you go. I swear, this happened to me. I had a security company. These guys were armed, too. And I had been walking around a while. I, I got in through the, fire, or, uh, the emergency exit. They had the alarm off during the day, picked the lock. They just had a basic tumbler lock there. Got in, walked in, walking around, doing my thing. Uh, and I was looking through a shredder bin, and the security guard comes up to me. And I'm like... No, <laughs> he's like, uh, well, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know, I, I, I torn up something, and I just want to make sure I ran into the shredder. He's like, oh, uh, let me see your badge, and I showed him. He's like, no, let me see your real badge. I was like, oh, this guy's good. Like, All right. I was like, well, come here for a second. And he's like, yeah. I was like, All right. Well, here, and I show him my fake letter. And I was like, so keep it on the down low, and if you can, let the rest of the guards know. Yeah. And he's like, okay. So he does that the entire time, the rest of the engagement, the security guards don't do anything. I actually had one of the guards smile at me was when I was walking by. <laughs> and so, yeah, they, it's, you have that instant connection where it's like, oh, there's this cool thing going on, and we're in the know, and nobody else is. But they really, feel a yeah. part of it. He actually said, you know, I'm with security too. And I'm like, obviously. <laughs> but, and so, yeah, you make them feel like you're working together. So even exploiting what Jason was encouraging is, is that, you know, oh, yeah, I'm doing this. Well, you're, n you're able to, to lie about it easier too because you're actually there for that test. But you have a fake name. You have a fake company name. Uh, and if you're testing incident response, this is an excellent way to test that because are they escalating it properly? Did they call that person? And if they did, how did they know that that person is the authority to, to grant this permission? They don't. So they should have, they should have a list of that. So um, this is an example letter. This is actually one we've used uh, and, you know, we've truncated some of the data and the, the logo there. But if you memorize it, you get a prize. We don't. <laughs> I know it's uh, it's pretty pretty tiny there, but you'll see that uh, we even get into some of the details about lock picking, dumpster diving, and stuff like that. I changed it. I could be there 24-7. I expanded the days. Mm -hmm. I put a bunch of, you know, BS in there. And I also said that I could walk out with, with company resources. So that if I had a laptop in my hand, he wouldn't say anything. Um, so this has... I've never actually, you know, I, I don't want to 
jinx myself, but I've never actually had to use uh, a letter of authorization. I have, anytime I have had to, I've actually used a fake letter and it's worked. And so, um, you know, you're giving them another chance. They did well and it should be in the commendable practices. Yeah, their security awareness is there. The guy stopped me, no question, saw that it was a fake badge, but he didn't follow through. He just took my word for it. Mm -hmm. And that was my kind of, my backup plan, my ace card. And so I really encourage fake letter of authorization. Uh, it could probably burn you in some instances, yeah. but uh, it's it's a good backup plan. Yes. So what would it look like for you to have to use your real letter of author, uh, like authorization after just presenting a fake letter? Of I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that. You. I'll let oh, Brent tell you. Yeah. Real. yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, it's not good. Here, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you guys go on OK and then show up with the real cops. Like, you know, they really called you. Well, uh, in the rules of engagement, well, I'll, uh, I'll get to the story in a second, but we actually put in there uh, that the client has to go through all extent so that, uh, and it specifically it says. Actually on the bottom there. Uh, Let me find it one second. About local law enforcement. Yeah, anyway, it says they have to go through all measures to make sure that we are not detained by company, local, or federal uh, agencies. Um, basically, if we get caught, hey, don't arrest our guys because that's going to suck. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, here is these are really genetic uh, non disclosure agreements. I wish that we could leave the real ones on there, but these are very similar to ones that we have. Uh, Crafted. The one on the right, I basically sat down in a coffee shop that was connected to a building uh, during breakfast, saw it. As I was sitting there, I just crafted it on my laptop while I'm looking at people. Uh, and then I walked across the street back to my hotel, had them printed off, and, and I got a really funny look that I was getting this badge thing printed off. And then I also asked for scissors and tape. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so before just coming up and asking for that, of course, I had a conversation with the lady about her her kids because I saw a picture. And uh, so by that time, she's like, "Oh yeah, here you go, honey. Here's some tape and scissors. Thank you, ma'am." Uh, did that. Went back across the street, and uh, so I mean, it's just that easy. So uh, you know, with with mine, um, it was funny because I got there and I had no idea what their badges looked like, and I only had a couple days. So. That's what's, you know, that's what's kind of crappy, too, about some of these assessments. And we're actually doing another talk that, um, you know, about checkbox security. When you guys are doing this kinds of stuff, don't always just do the minimum. And, oh, well, let's do a pen test. So let's have it done in a week. Okay. Well, the bad guys have a lot more time and a lot more resources sometimes, too, uh, if, if they're able to expand that window. They don't care about a testing window, right? Yeah. So, but when you're rushed like that, sometimes you got to think on the fly, and it helps to do that. So what happened was I got in, um, again, through the emergency exit because companies, please, companies, if you guys have fire escapes and stuff and you've got an external lock facing outward, upgrade the cores. Don't have these old ancient cores that have been in there probably since the 90s. Yeah, buy a Medco or something, stuff, cheap stuff. Yeah. So um, got in there. And I actually got into an administrator's office, and she had letterheads, she had envelopes, all this stuff. Well, at that point, I had gotten a good look at what the badges looked like, and I went to the bathroom. I was ripping, licking, and peeling, ripping uh, up these envelopes and stuff, and I had a picture, my picture uh, that I usually keep on me, and I, I made a, a badge by sticking them on top of each other in layers in one of those plastic sleeves. And I thought it looked pretty good, like for <laughs> for poorly putting it together. But it worked for that first day until I, that later night. That night I was able to go to my hotel. Same thing. <clears throat> we print. We use the hotel printers a lot to yep. print fake badges. I uh, was able to go there and print, come up with a fake badge, and print it off, and it looked pretty decent. Uh, something that I've been doing too is, you know, has anybody seen? I'm sure Mr. Robot. Well, I've been using Elliot Alderson as my uh, my alias, uh, just just to see, and uh, nobody knows who the heck that is. But it's funny; people call me Elliot going in doing this stuff. So. Uh, in addition to the fake badges, 
Uh, that's the, kind of the standard size, but if you get on Amazon or anything like that, you can get a pack of these head badges, super cheap, like yep. six bucks. For yeah, a huge stack of them. So even if you're cloning badges or you're just wanting to make a handful of uh, fakes with some adhesive paper, then um, yeah. And uh, mentioned open source intelligence earlier too. Sometimes you can find company photos, like at a, a company function, or people <coughs> hanging out with their cocktails and they've got their badge on. So then you just zoom in on the picture and see what the company badges are without even going on site first. That way you don't have to use the hotel printer or whatever. You can already have a few ideas with you. That way, maybe they have two or three different types. You're not sure how recent the picture is. Just make one up like that. Have it with you. When you get there, just throw in the right one and be on your way. So. So we mentioned, um, you know, we've touched on the redirection stuff, but, you know, making your story believable, how do you do that? Um, again, it's all about being comfortable with your story, comfortable with your lies. Uh, if you're not able to just kind of talk on the fly or have a quick conversation and bounce back and forth, it can be a little bit uh, difficult, especially if you're not really stuck with your story and you're like stumbling over it. Oh, I thought you said you were with... IT security. Now you're staying with networking. That's two different departments. Yeah, we don't even have a networking department. Yeah. Who you here with? Oh, whatever. Yeah. And because people do, I mean, when they catch you, you'll have a good conversation with them. You think you're going some way and you get some traction. And then all of a sudden you stumble and you mess up because you yeah. trip over a lot. So uh, being short and sweet is, is a beautiful thing. Thanks, Tim. It is. It is. <laughs> oh, that was a bad joke. Sorry, that was stupid. I'll never say that again. So that's why I'm sitting in the chair. Because yeah. if I stand up, I, um, I was going to stand in the chair, but he sat down first. So, but short and sweet, right? Keeping yeah. it uh, friendly, but don't yeah. don't go overboard. If you're talking and you're you, you know we're like blah blah blah, and I just start talking about a whole bunch of stuff, and I get so involved in my side conversation, my distracting conversation, that I end up giving myself away. Yeah. And it's happened before. So, mm -hmm. you know, just like what they tell a lot of people if an auditor comes in, hey, say the bare minimum. Don't tell that auditor this or that, right? Same thing for us. When we're coming in testing or doing an assessment, we want to keep it vague and let them fill in the blanks. Yep. Um, you know, I did, we did a talk a while back, um, and I mentioned a story, and I won't repeat the story, but uh, the lady filled in the all all the information for me. She just looked at my badge. You know, I'm sitting there talking to her. I told her I was new, and she's like, "Oh, you are." And I was like, "Yeah." And I was looking for um, that, uh, the network manager guy, uh, and she filled in his yep. name. Oh, uh, yeah, huge, yeah. Huge Isn't package. he in this building? And I noticed that there were generators on the side of the building. These power generators. So I assume, well, their data center is probably in here, right? So. I'm in there, and I'm like, okay, well, I was supposed to meet him in the data center. And then the security guard comes up because somebody had called and said, hey, there's a guy up here wandering around. Um, what's up? And the security guard came up. She, she vouched for me. And any time you're able to establish that rapport with these people and they vouch for you and there are actual authorities in there, it's good. you're good to go. So even just reining back your conversation, letting them talk and fill in the blanks for you, it helps yeah. quite a bit. It's amazing how much people will answer things for you without you even asking them for asking them the question. Uh, another trick that we'll use too, just to kind of build on that, um, you're talking to someone on the phone, hey, uh, we're from IT security, we're doing a quick password audit, just want to make sure that it meets password complexity. We're showing that your current password is kittens13. No, no, my password is, and then they'll say, oh, okay, well, that meets the requirements. Thank you so much. You move on. So just, uh, yeah, let's let, learn how to just let people assume that you know the answer or they'll give you the answer so much. Uh, so that's another thing for everyone, too, if you're not on that side of it. Just be careful to not blab everything, you know, like, oh, you must be looking for the server room right there. I know, you know? where that is. Let yeah. me show you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So anyway. Just be careful what you tell people. So another war story here. Um, this is pretty funny. Uh, me and another co-worker, Drew Colbertson, we were going in, and um, he had a contractor badge. Well, I had a fake badge that I made up. He was a contractor, and I was his escort. So we walked through the front where the security guard is, who is preoccupied talking to some people. There was a turnstile. We jumped over the turnstile, walked right in. They didn't say anything. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a very oblivious... Security guard, but whatever. 
We're it's, in. It's parkour day in the office. Exactly. <laughs> so we walk on in. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, we go to the, sur or, uh, the networking department. Well, they got a proximity reader, but they also have a lever handle. So I use an under-the-door tool, pop it. Nobody asks or said anything. There were people walking by, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> drop my keys. Has I'm anybody sorry. not seen an under-the-door tool? Hang on a second. Keep talking. So I'm using it. I, I get in. Oh, well, no, 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 no. The networking department, the end of the door tool is basically, it's like this uh, thick gauge wire kind of hooks. It's like this long. Got a piano string and a little pulley. So you shove it under there, and when you pull it, it, uh, it hooks on the latch, and you pull the piano string, and it gives. And it's enough, it's enough gauge wire that it's uh, strong enough to pull it down. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it scrapes against the, the side of it. It's very loud. Yeah. So, so you know, and we weren't, I, we were kind of being loud at this point because we had gathered some other things, and we were like, oh, okay, whatever. Let's just prove that this sucks. Um, <laughs> so we did it. We got in the networking department. Well, the networking department's connected to the server room. The server room has a hard lock that bypasses the electronic lock. <laughs> so I go over there, and uh, Drew's looking out for me, and I, I pick the lock, and I get in the server room. Well, in there, they've got all kinds of stuff. They had an instruction booklet on how to remotely connect using the VPN. They had a, a list of some accounts. Mm -hmm. They had their security system was already logged into uh, for their IDS and stuff. And so I saw the username there, and I could have just went through and got a bunch of data, right? So after we're in there for a little bit, we decide to leave. And this is uh, where the funny part. Uh, we walk by this room. It's a security control room. It's labeled. We look in there. You can look through the glass. It's not shaded or anything. Look in there. There's there's cameras everywhere. The screens. They've got their uh, DVR. They've got a badge printer for badges. They've got a, a box, a big aluminum box with physical keys inside of it. To to all the that facility, they had it to a server room, another server room, and another facility, and they had vehicle keys in there. So anyway, I'm there. I picked that lock. Oh, I drink. Serious? This is a security control room, and they didn't have anything but a normal residential, uh, like five pin lock or something. Get in. I'm like, oh, this is there's this. We're in there looking around. Well, I see a uh, in the in the lock box with the keys. I'm going through them, trying to find some sensitive keys. One says uh, like server room, like facility number two, label. I'm like, oh, crap. Wish I could take this because we're going to that facility tomorrow i'd love to try those out and so we're not allowed to take them so what i do i got my camera from my smartphone set the key down and i took a picture of it took several pictures well that night it was arts and craft night for solutionary and we went by lowe's we picked up some files actually we went there and we actually tried to get the guy to to print a key off for us because I had used the pla my plastic hotel key and I cut it in the shape of the key just to see if he would, do, you know, do it. And he was he actually tried, give him credit, whatever, or not credit because it's Lowe's and they probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> but he, uh, we're there. He was going to do it. Well, we're like, you know, let's just buy some files and we'll just do it ourselves. So we got there and we're all trying to make these keys. Well, if you look here, the top one A is the real key. B is the one. I did with a file uh, using a picture. We got back the next time. The key worked. I, I swear to you, the key worked. <laughs> and so, even taking a picture of a key and filing is a possibility. You got to just think outside of the box with that. But the funniest part of this story is uh, when we had left, we were like, "Man, we've really we got to try to get caught or something." I was like, "Well, I'm going to push the envelope." He's like, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" And I started walking to the security guard. Well, I pull out my keys, the keychain. It only had a few keys on it. I had it in my hand. I'm sitting there tapping on the desk, talking to the security guard. And I was like, hey, uh, yeah, Tom from Facilities. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a key inventory. I'm trying to get into the security control room, and Tom from Facilities gave me this key, and it doesn't work, but he said he might have one. And she's like, you better return these. <laughs> yeah. And she Hand drops over. her security, yeah. her, the security guard gave me the keys. Bam, just in, in my hand, I walk. Sure enough, it opens the security control room and all this other stuff. So um, I really, what I really encourage, and from this sword story, it, out of anything, was 
security awareness, especially if you're hiring a security vendor. You've got a you've got a contract company that's there, and you're paying them X amount of dollars to maintain your physical security. They're one of the first barriers that people have to go through. And if they're willing to just hand over the keys because someone said, you know, a name, a name from facilities was blah blah blah. Well, why does this guy need my keys, and why doesn't his key work? And why? And she didn't even pay attention that that key didn't even look anything like no. the number. A uh, quick phone call. Number sixty. <laughs> nine key or whatever that was so so we talked about what happens when you do use the fake one and that doesn't work and you've got to give your real one so uh an assessment that i did i talked about the badge where i made the the badge on photoshop while i was in the cafe so with that client i went into that building was great knocked on the front door to a single suite told her i was there for uh, maintenance or uh, i was there to do inventory with it and she's like uh, okay, and I was like, well, here's my badge. I was like, I'm new. It probably doesn't work yet. So she let me in. And she said, well, you probably don't know where the server room is either. I was like, yeah, I've never been here before. And so she takes me in, props it open, says, I'll be at my desk. Come get me when you're done. So that was great. Walked around. She even opened the, unlocked the doors for me for uh, the CEO that was there. It was great. Thanked her for her time and left. And I said, okay, this next place for the same client is going to be so much fun because it's a huge, it's a two building campus, huge parking lot, just a gigantic place. It's going to be fun to get in there. So apparently uh, I had to, I had to tell the client what had happened as I was driving from this place to an hour north of there. She wasn't very happy about that. So by the time I got to this other place, I find out now I'm pretty positive. She told him I was coming uh, because again, it was a corporate park. Lots of buildings, huge parking lot. There were probably close to 200 cars there. Um, walked around the first building. Uh, people were pretty good about not giving information because the previous year, Tim actually did an assessment there and just tore them to pieces. So this year, it wasn't going to happen again. They were sure about that. Whatever they had to do, whether it was telling their people, hey, this is going on right now, look out for this guy. So... Um, so walked around the first building and was talking to a few people. Hey, the badge won't work. And I said, well, you got to go to that building, check in, get a visitor badge. Okay, cool. Thank you for your time. Uh, saw a few stairwells I was looking at maybe going up later after I'd walked around the other building. Get to the other building, pick the lock to a maintenance door. Like, oh, all right, I'm in. I open it, and it just goes into a room with hoses, uh, eight, uh, air ducts. And, well, I didn't want to climb through air ducts that day because, one, it's dirty, too. It was out of scope, thank God. So I just closed that back, walking around the building, and I take two steps, and I see a door, and it says security guard office. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, crap, someone just saw me. I know it. So as I was turning around, the door busts open. Huge guy, huge guy runs out. Can I help you? Like, very intimidating, like, uh, I was wanted to say, no, you cannot, but, well, I'm here to do inventory, but my badge doesn't work. Um, you need to come with me. Well, I'm here to see, and he just interrupted, you need to come with me. I was like, oh, well, okay, it happened finally. So as I'm following this uh, guy inside, I was like, it said it exactly like this, like, all right, man, you caught me. And he looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? I was like, well, it was like, I'm here doing an assessment, and... Uh, I was like, I've got my letter in my pocket, so I start handing it to him, and I was like, and it says, uh, here's the contact info, and as I was showing it to him, he just let, it just shakes his head, he's not even buying it, and I was like, but seriously, here it is, I need you to look at this, please, and he's just not listening to me, uh, escorts me to the front, uh, the HR director comes out, like, by this time, by the time he gets me up there, and I explain to the receptionist, who was the same receptionist when Tim owned him really hard last year, she's like, Oh, yeah, I knew you guys were doing that again this year. So I was like, thanks for approving my theory right there. Uh, she's like, well, I've got to make a few phone calls. And I was like, well, if, if it's all right, I'd like to continue, you know, see if there are any sort of physical vulnerabilities that I can help you guys out with. Yeah, sure, that's all right. Just let me make some phone calls. By this time, four people were surrounding me in this lobby, including the gigantic, gigantor guy. <laughs> and um, Bri I get Phil is breath, crying and stuff. Uh, no, not really. I, it was weird, though. 
Anyway, uh, HR director comes out, who'd you say you were with? And so by this time, I was kind of confused because the receptionist said, yeah, you can continue. So I was like, well, I'm going to continue. It's like, yeah, I'm Ken Adams. I'm from IT. I'm supposed to meet a guy here in the server room to do some inventory. Okay, let me see your badge. And I was like, oh, wait, she really wanted to know who I was. And I was like, oh, wait, here's my letter. This is who I really am. Here's the lady that said it's okay for me to come do this. She's like, you need to stay right here. I came back. My badge had been ripped. And she said, this isn't a real badge. And hands it back to me. Takes my letter, looks at it, and makes a phone call. And then hands it back to me. And uh, before I could say anything, she's like, you need to leave the premises. I was like, okay. So in that case, what can you do? You know, I wasn't going to run because I was really far away from my car and it was really hot. And I'm kind of lazy, so uh, I didn't want to get shot in the back either. I think that was, I don't know, he was armed and very large. He probably would have just tackled me and I would have died. So, um, so I mean, you can't really do anything. You're just like, all right, game's over. Uh, but at that point, again, I'm pretty sure that they all knew I was coming because the security guard told me, I watched you from the moment you got out of your car, and I watched you walk around every single building and every move you made. And then I said, well, did you see me pick the maintenance uh, closet door over there where there's no camera? And he said, no. And I said, you guys need a camera over there. And uh, only one security guard for the whole company. Uh, if we would have had Tim with us, he probably could have got in while I was getting busted. So um, sometimes you just... You know, you can't really get out of it, and you just got to be honest and comply so you don't get tackled or set on. And you're not losing, right? It's like what Jason was saying. I, I, I really enjoyed Jason's talk. His, and those who have been in the InfoSec community, you, you know exactly what he was talking about. If you've been on both sides of the fences, too. And, uh, you know, I used to do incident response and stuff, and so I, I, I know that. And so when you are caught... Commend them on that. Yep. That's a good thing. I mean, that's what you're testing. That's the results the client's expecting or looking for. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, not something for you to weigh around as an accomplishment. Oh, look what yep. I did. I totally own these guys when I got the security guard to give me your keys and yep. rubbed it in her face and threw it at her and left. Yeah. You know? Threw it to the ground. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a competition. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the things that, uh, that I did right away. I was like, hey, we did this last year. We got quite a bit of stuff, but man, you were on top of it. You caught me quick. That's the fastest I've ever been caught. And I was going to show this while I was telling you. That's too good to not show. So one of the first things I did after they asked me to leave the premises is I called the, the client contact and said, look, this one didn't go as well for me, but you guys did great. Uh, they caught me right away. Uh, here are the names of the people that were involved in uh, and were very, very vigilant about what was going on. So great job on that. Uh, she was pretty happy about about the results. So, um, so um, another story, real quick. <clears throat> One of the recent. I think, uh, I think we're supposed to be done right now. Yeah, I guess we got to start wrapping up here. Yeah. Uh, well, if you guys want to talk afterwards, I'll tell you another story. Um, but uh, real quick, wrapping up. Uh, when you, whenever you are gathering your things and you're about to leave, uh, always note, hey, did I uh, revisit the scope? What What were you looking for? Hmm. You know, where, did you take good notes? Sometimes it's hard to take notes because you're sweating, you're trying not to get caught. What are you going to go? Well, the bathroom is one of my favorite places to go because it's a great office. You sit in the stall, do what you got to do. Nobody's really going to um, bother you too much in there. Right. So uh, take good notes, take good logs. Um, you know, if, uh, if you've left, like, some of your equipment around. Um, like a like pwn a plug or, or, or key rubber logger. duckies or something like that. Uh, always make sure you get that because, uh, you know, there's been times I've almost left and I'm like, oh, crap, I forgot to put that key logger on the receptionist's computer. I didn't that. <laughs> um, and that's got good stuff on it, right? So uh, you got to go back and fetch your things. Um, and make sure you've taken plenty of pictures so you can – because remember, at the end of this, there's always a report that's expected. The more stuff that you take pictures, evidence of, the easier your life's going to be when you put the report together. So – um, clean up, you know, if you've propped anything open, uh, etc. You want to make sure you're putting it back. Um, you know, is this a black box or a cold assessment? Is an incident response part of it? Is it? If it is, you know, do like like what we've done. Go back and try to 
push the envelope a little bit further. Try to get caught. Do do the most ridiculous thing you can until you get caught. So. All right. That's about it. Does anybody have any questions or anything for us? I know it's kind of high level. Uh, there's, from what we've been told, that's not really something that can be done because of privacy. Uh, so we haven't done that. It's not really anything that's been asked of us yet either. So. That's very much possible. Oh. Yeah. I, I actually, well, I can't, never mind. Never mind. I wasn't saying anything. Oh gosh. Well, that's that's the thing too, um, and something I want to say. You know, a lot of times when people first get into this, they use like the rake and stuff like that, and, all, and bump keys, and because uh, it's it's quick and it's it's easy to do, especially if they're old tumbler locks. Uh, but you know, I, I think the more practice you have, also if they're going to be using those locks and they're not going to replace them, you don't want to scratch up the pins and stuff in there with a with a rake or a bump key. Um, yeah, make sure that picking the lock is something that's in scope because it's not always accepted. Yeah. Know? So, um, but you know, I don't know. Um, I know I, I know that we kind of hear we kind of hear both sides from the community because uh, lock lock sport is a huge thing, and those guys are incredibly talented. You know, single pin picking, all this all these crazy lock stuff that I honestly am terrible at. But when it comes to an engagement, you're trying to get in and out then yeah, we'll use bump keys, we'll use rakes, as long as it's in scope, because it's quick, it gets us in and out, you know, it's, uh, and so for that, it works for us, but then we also hear the other side, oh, well, you're raking it, you're, you know, scratching the lock or whatever, which in some cases we, we could, but I've never had a client come back and complain, hey, we noticed two little scratches on the inside of a pin on this back door, you know, we took it apart and looked at it and you suck, you know. Or why would Nobody's you, why are you still that. using that lock is my first question, right? Yeah. Why are you still using that lock? Who cares? Throw it away. Yeah. It needs to be in the trash anyway. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you need to be able to, and, and I say this as a professional, and I know, like, especially a lot of the physical security guys out there that maybe see this video or whatever, uh, you know, it's important that you get skilled at using, like, single hook and Bogota and stuff like that. Because it's not just, you know, rake and arm in. Uh, because, you know, sometimes it's, it's nice to be able to, to fall back on that because not all locks are going to be simplistic like that. There's more complex locks and, mm -hmm. and such. Yeah. And then also if you use wafer, like the wafer locks, uh, I know Sparrow's got a good set. Those things work great for trash bin locks and, oh, yeah. and safes and stuff. And some ATMs, uh, I was, maybe. I was just going to add that the other thing, too, is you can try to use those bump keys and stuff like that to keep the security in the house. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. That's another thing, too. Consider where you're at, you know. Being in a stairwell outside, you know, with cars and stuff, it's probably more practical. But doing it on like an executive suite door or office, yeah, where you're not sure on. who's on the inside <laughs> and like, what on the, who's like kicking the door down? Or what's yeah. going on? And they just come open it for you and then call security. So, you're taking a special needs posture. Special needs posture. Uh, no, but I used to do loss prevention. I saw like people use that to steal stuff. <laughs> yeah, we. But no, I know. I haven't. Personally. I know the assessments that I've been on. There hasn't really been like kind of the opportunity to do that because a lot of times they'll will reduce so many of these things. They'll send us one at a time. That maybe if it's like if you have a team and you have somebody that can kind of push you through or something, it would work better. But I haven't had the the chance to do that. But that is actually a pretty good tactic. And it goes back so. to the the whole like you know oh, I got my arms full. Can you hold the door open for me? You know tactic. Mm -hmm. If you got crutches or Especially crutches, a little more easier to, to move around with if you have to run or, or up the stairs. Or and especially like when it's raining, too. <clears throat> You're getting you know, soaking wet and crutches. Or wet angles might not hold the door open for a guy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so just think, I know it's it's a terrible, when you're talking about it, like, man, that is so wrong. But the reality of the thing is that uh, you have criminals out there that don't care, and they do these, they legitimately do these things to gain access. So it is good to practice those things so that people can be aware to strengthen your security posture. So unfortunately, that has to be something that people consider. So we take one more question. Okay, it's a little offbeat, but given what you know from doing these assessments, what would you do on your own home or one of those like houses converted to an office kind of thing? A moat. 
Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> a fire. Sharks with freaking lasers on their heads. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there's a lot of different things. So windows. Windows are one of the uh, criminals. That's uh, one of the first things. They'll pop a window open because a lot of them, uh, they just have the little, you know, you latch your window and it's either plastic or even if it's like aluminum or something, it only maybe like a quarter of an inch that it goes in. So if you just get a good screwdriver, you hit it really hard, it's going to pop that and you go right in. Get stronger locks or... If you want to look kind of like a like an old lady house, you don't really care. Get some wooden doyle, stick them in there. That way, even if they pop that lock, I mean, there's a physical thing that's keeping the window from going up and down. Yeah, that uh, yeah, landscaping can be a good deterrent. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. Just lighting. I mean, just the basic cheapo locks and things that come on your house. Upgrade your lock. Uh, you can you can actually upgrade your door frame so people can't bust through those. Uh, there's a few cheap options to actually strengthen your door frames, uh, your locks, and then um, home security systems. Yeah, so. Two side locks and stuff. Yeah. Uh, another thing too, real quick. Uh, you know, I, I used to. I know a friend that runs a home security company, and he was talking about one of the things he commonly sees is that the the, the uh, stuff upstairs, like if it's a multi-tiered house, the windows upstairs are often neglected. Mm -hmm. um, oh well, I only have X amount of sensors I can put on, so I'm not going to put it on that. Well, then you've got your garage door with a cheap, you know, Walgreens padlock on it. And it's got a ladder in there. Okay, well, thanks for the ladder. I'll just go ahead and climb up here now. Yeah. Um, but he saw that a lot. Or ladders on the side of the house. If you've got that stuff, just put it away. Yeah, don't don't help them out. <laughs> yeah. Here's a hammer and some bub keys. Yeah. Ladders on the side of your neighbor's house. This is bad. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, it, certain yeah. states. I know uh, Tennessee requires if, uh, to do lock picking, you have to actually have a locksmith license. And I know uh, certain states have laws about actually owning and purchasing lock picks. So just check with your local state laws. Yeah, and if you're actually part of a red team thing, I always I like to have somebody on the team that has a lock picking uh, or the, the locksmith. Uh, License just because you get access to some other tools that you may not be able to have access to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, as far as your average pen tester or whatever, including lock picking and stuff and the things, again, it just depends on the state and the client scope. Um, TSA has never given me any grief aside from the jackknife I keep, uh, like the the Southward jackknife I keep. Um, because it looks like a knife, but I've never actually had any grief as far as the airport goes with that. But again, it depends on what you're what you're taking to and what you got in there. You yeah. gotta some sometimes they'll give you issues about a shove knife too. You can explain like, no, it's not a weapon. It's just an oddly shaped piece of metal. So it's not my teeth. Yeah. Back All right, cavities. guys. Well, I think we're a little over time here. But if you guys uh, have any questions afterwards, thank you.